The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won over your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, so that every fact may be established and the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen, tell the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as you would a Gentile or tax collector. Amen, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, amen, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything for which they are to pray, it shall be granted to them by my heavenly Father. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. One of the interesting things that, that happens in my, my role as priest is that there's a certain age of children that are completely mistaken about my identity. They think I'm God. You all know that I'm far from it. But there's, there's that age about, I think, three or four, because they know we're in God's house and we're praying to God and, you know, who's the one in the, you know, different kind of clothes and is, is leading everybody. So they think this is God. They think I'm God. And there was one experience where this really came home to me, is I had accompanied this family, and um, as, as this older gentleman died, um, this little girl's grandpa, grandfather. So I'd been to the house and prayed with them and celebrated the anointing of the sick with them. And then a week or two after the funeral, after he had died, this little girl came up to me and basically hit me. She was angry at me. She says, why did you take my grandpa? It really, really kind of upset me because intellectually I understand, you know, she sees me in this role as God. But yet just that, that emotion of she thinking that I had something to do and taking her grandfather away from her. Because obviously her parents had told her, you know, grandpa's fine, he's with God now. The reason I bring that up it's because, again, in my role as a priest, there's that special sacramental roles that gather people together for Eucharist, preaching the word of God and celebrating the Eucharist. But yet all of us, by virtue of our baptism, represent God to one another, represent Christ to one another. That there are things that we do in our lives that show forth that love of Christ. There are things that we do in our life as well that can be a contrary sign, a contrary witness to that presence and love of Christ in our midst. And especially as we gather as church, when, we, when people identify us as people of faith, as Christians, as Catholics, a lot of people will see in us a lot of things, rightly or wrong. As people of faith, maybe people, other people that are searching for faith or are struggling with their faith or for some reason are against anybody of faith, they will have a certain opinion of us and rightly or wrongly judge us. And oftentimes people that are open and looking and searching for Christ will see in us, whether, when we gather here for worship, when we're out and about in our everyday living, something of Christ's love, something of Christ's reconciliation and peace. We show forth that image of Christ. 
Jesus is so insistent today in the relationships that we have as church, the relationships that we have with one another. He wasn't talking about just in general that it should be nice, we should get along after all. What Jesus is insisting is how do we put love into practice? And he gives us these examples. When there's conflicts among you, what must you do? And we we have all heard this before. Yes, first and foremost, we must go one-on-one and deal with our brother or sister. We don't announce it to the whole world. And then if things don't get resolved, then are there other people we can bring into this? How can the church help us? And finally, if that doesn't work, then treat them as a Gentile or tax collector. In other words, how did Jesus treat them? Did he shun them? No. Continue to invite them in. So what I'd like to reflect with us this morning is not only the what of what Jesus is saying, but the why. Why did Jesus insist on this so much? Why didn't Jesus just just say, okay, I understand, you're human, you're on the road to holiness. I know you're striving for perfection. We all know that you're not there yet. But why did Jesus say this is so important that we can't ignore it, we can't put it on the back burner? The reason is, is because of our, our identity. As church, we're the visible body of Christ. And as such, as such, Christ is about unity. Christ is about communion. He's about bringing us all into one. And so when there's things that divide us, and in fact, when we perpetuate divisions, when we hold on to hates, when we push other people away, we are not showing forth the body of Christ. We are not showing forth the image of who we are and called to be. We are showing forth another image. And how in the world will people come to know Christ when we are showing forth some other image of who he is and what he calls us to be? That's why this is so important. That's why we can't ignore it. That's why we just can't go along with the flow. Because we know how cruel our world can be. It seems to be acceptable when we disagree with another person. We don't need to have any respect in showing that disagreement. In fact, we can anonymously post it all over the internet and feel fine about ourselves. This is what I believe I have a right to do this. That flies in the face of what Jesus is telling us, and it flies in the face of who we are. We cannot be Christian. We cannot be members of the body of Christ if we do that to one another. How can we come together to celebrate the sacrament of unity when we still hold in our hearts these grudges, these resentments? We need to let go of them. And again, I'm thinking about that, that encounter I had with that little girl. She was holding me up as, as God. Obviously, I'm not. But yet I, as a priest, and all of us as baptized, are showing forth to our world and showing forth to one another that presence of Christ. And I dare say that what we do and how we do it, the witness that we give, this is all about evangelization. Again, evangelization isn't only about preaching on a street corner. But it's first and foremost of how do we give witness to the love of Christ to others? What do people see in us? We do not live our faith in secret. We do not, we're not anonymous Christians. We are people that profess Christ. We're people that show forth his love. We're people that come together here to be renewed in that communion with Christ. So what do we do about this? What all of us are called to do is to take these words to heart. I invite us throughout this week to come back to these words. What is Jesus calling us to do? Who are those people that I have had a conflict with? What are those ways in which you and I, and we we all do it in various ways, have failed to first go to this person? What is one concrete step 
that you and I can take this, way, this week to reach out to somebody, to reach out to somebody that I've judged, that I've criticized, that I've talked badly about, this person that I've shunned. How can I go and speak to that person? How can I go and welcome that person back in to that realm of love, as St. Paul tells us? The more that we can do that, the more that we can understand the great gift that we have before us in this Eucharist, the more our world will come to understand and to know that great love and that peace of Christ for all his sons and daughters.